Our scripture lesson comes to us from the Gospel of John, the 12th chapter, beginning at the 20th verse. Listen for the word of God. Now among those who went up to worship at the festival were some Greeks, and they came to Philip, who was from uh, Bethsaida in Galilee, and said to him, Sir, we wish to see Jesus. And Philip went and told Andrew. And Andrew, uh, then Andrew and Philip went and told Jesus. And Jesus answered them, The hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. Very truly, I tell you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the earth and dies, it remains a single grain. But if it dies, it bears much fruit. And those who love their life will lose it. And those who hate their life in this world will keep it for eternal life. Whoever serves me must follow me. And where I am, there will my servant also be. Whoever serves me, the Father will honor. Now my soul is troubled. And what should I say? Father, save me from this hour? No. It is for this reason that I have come to this hour. Father, glorify your name. Then the voice, a voice from, uh, came from heaven. I have glorified it, and I will glorify it again. And the crowd standing there heard it and said it was thunder. Others said, an angel has spoken to him. Jesus answered, this voice has come from, uh, for your sake, not for mine. Now is the judgment of the world. Now the rulers of this world will be driven out. And I, when I am lifted up from the earth, will draw all people to myself. He said this to indicate the kind of death he was to die. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. I need to get the remote. Is it over here? Okay. I have been really excited about spring as it's come, uh, finally. It seems like it's taken it forever this year, but uh, now it's finally upon us, and, and uh, we're, we're ready to get going with all the, the, the new growth that springtime brings to us. And, and I think it's interesting that our scripture today has Jesus teaching, using an example, out of the garden, if you will, or out of farming, uh, unless a, a grain of wheat is willing to die. Uh, it stays alone, but when it is willing to do that, it grows into a full harvest. And thinking about that in the springtime, it, uh, it, it, it gave me an occasion to do something I like to do a lot, and that is to kind of talk a bit about gardening, and to do that in a way that I think helps nourish and nurtures our faith. We... Uh, we know that this last week or two, it's kind of begun to warm up, and if you look around, you see the signs of spring showing up all around us, and, and with the, the rain that we've had, it comes to, to nourish the earth and to get it ready, and all kinds of new growth ready to take place. And Carl uh, Shank, or Schink is a, a United Methodist pastor up in uh, the Kansas City area, and he uh, talks a little bit about, about gardening, and he remembers when his, during, from his childhood, there was always a debate about when you planted your potatoes. So maybe you've had this debate uh, on occasions. Do you plant them on St. Patrick's Day, or do you plant them on Good Friday? It was always the debate. Those who wanted to get an early start would go for St. Patrick's Day, but the problem is if you, if you plant them on St. Patrick's Day, you don't have them to eat on St. Patrick's evening. So, uh, but he always advocated for using it later. But, but um, always that debate, when, when can you tell when it's gonna be warm enough? And, and I think we've held off so long, winter stayed so long that uh, we just kind of bounded into springtime uh, for us. The thing he said is though, once you decide to plant, and you plant those potatoes into the ground, you never go back to them, right? 
And if you were to dig them up again in just a, a even if matter a few days, but, but a week or two, what you'd find is that plant that uh, looks so good to eat, to cook, uh, before you put it into the ground has now begun to rot and to decay. And it's in that rotting that it begins to root and to begin to send out new growth. Even something like a potato has to be willing to die, has to be willing to give of itself in order to bring about new life. I remember learning to, to garden at my grandmother's. We, I grew up in Oklahoma City, so you know we had just a very small yard. My grandmother uh, had a bigger yard, and she had a beauty shop. And um, it was on the front of her house. And so uh, what in my day as a kid I saw was all the little old ladies coming in to get their hair done every week. Um, on Mondays, that all stopped. And Mondays were the day whenever my mom and her kids, me and my brother and sister, and, and her sisters would all come over to the house, my grandmother's house, and we would work in the garden through the summer. And on Mondays, you could always count on it. And uh, we would go out to pick tomatoes, to water, to pick green beans, or whatever it was to, to work in, in that garden. And it was there that I learned, to, uh, learned what gardening was about. Also, I, I, I learned a few other lessons that I had to unlearn. Uh, in my family, we never went out to eat. We always ate at home, except when on Mondays when we went to my grandmother's, and she would always buy lunch for us. And the only time I had ever seen a hamburger that had seeds on it, sesame seeds on it, was on Mondays at my grandmother's. And I thought, as a little kid now, as a little kid, that you could take those seeds and grow hamburgers because that's what we did at her house on Mondays, you know? And, and kids, you associate things in ways like, I, I unlearned it as time went on, but that's what I thought I, as, a, as a little kid. I, I could remember picking the seeds off and going out to plant them. My hamburger plants, you know. It, it's, kid, kids do funny things. But, and and, and be, partly because of that, and, and she, my dad and my grandmother, um, although they were opposite sides of the families, my mom's mom and my dad, my dad had the print shop, and he would always run an ad in the paper for someone, you know, if you needed someone to um, mow your yard. And since he had the beacon and the newspaper was there, it was easy. He just kept it in there year round. And so I would get phone calls from people all over South Oklahoma City looking for someone to mow their yard. And then my grandmother, she had this ready built in uh, group at her house. And so I would mow her yard and the ladies would come in and they would see me mowing their yard. And so they would ask if I could mow their yards. And pretty soon my mom, I was about 10 years old, would just drop me off at my grandmother's house. And then I would spend the day out from her house going out to, to mow yards. And, and, um, and that shaped my life in a lot of ways. I, uh, you know, it gave me something to keep me busy and out of trouble and to make some money, put some money in my pocket as a kid. But even to the point where I was in graduate school in seminary in Atlanta, uh, realized I needed to be doing something in the summer. Mostly it was Angie's idea. She wanted to keep me busy, I think, and, and um, that needed to be doing something to make some extra money in the summertime to pay for school. And so uh, I made up all these flyers and took them out around the neighborhood, around Emory University, and, and picked up some yards to mow. And one of them was a lady named Martha Felder. Martha, uh, you know, of course, I played all the gimmicks of, you know, seminary student needing help in school, and that, that was all true. And Martha went to the Methodist church that was on the campus of Emory, Glen Memorial. And um, Martha's husband had been one of the groundskeepers and a repairman at the college. And, um, and so she decided it would be her way to help somebody in seminary, so she hired me. And first she hired me to, to mow her yard, but then there was very obviously something else that needed work in her yard, and that is she and her husband loved roses, and they had a hundred rose bushes on there in their yard. And she asked me if I knew anything about taking care of them, and I said, I don't, but if you tell me what to do, I can do that. And so she would teach me and she would show me about caring for roses. And... Um, 
all hundred of them. And, and, and it, was, it was a wonderful thing. I, we became really quite close because I would show up at her house every Monday because that was the day I didn't have any classes. And I would go to her house, and she would always fix lunch for me. And we would have a break, and I'd go in and would sit down at her table and would talk. And she'd always fix some kind of toasted sandwich and some kind of, uh, uh, of soup. She made the greatest navy bean soup. It was just fabulous. And we would we'd sit and talk, and she'd tell me about her family. She'd tell me about her church, and, and she'd talk to me about roses and teach me how to how to care for them, and, and, and created in me a love for, for rose gardening. I, I didn't really care much for them before, but, but it became this really kind of special association uh, for me about learning uh, how, how life grows uh, from the garden. And Martha was the person who, who helped teach me that. And growth is something that is inherent to nature. It's inherent to, to nature that, that we grow. All of nature uh, finds a way to, to grow, and we do in our lives as well. Uh, physically, we grow up. Uh, we get maybe to a place where we're maxed out on height. Unfortunately, sometimes we grow wider. I've done that. I, you all have treated us well. I've, I've gained a good bit of weight since I've been here for the last two years. I was telling Angie I need to start working on that. But we, um, we grow in our lives spiritually as well that we uh, grow closer to God and God's direction for our, our lives. And one of the, but, but I gain a lot spiritually from working in the garden. And in this first year and a half, I wasn't able to spend a lot of time doing that. I was really pretty focused on lots of things we had going on in the church. And, and, and since um, Ashley's been here and working, it's, it's helped relieve some of that. And so I've gotten to spend a little time this spring and in the winter working in the, the gardens around the, the parsonage. I planted 40 rose bushes this year. Uh, you, you probably will have no idea to even see that right now, but, but just wait till the fall as they all begin to, to come up into some size. And, and uh, by next spring, we'll have to have a, an open house for you to come and see the, the roses at the parsonage because they, they ought to be just, just beautiful by that time. But, but growth is a spiritual thing. And we can learn a lot from, the rose, uh, from, from gardening in terms of, of our own growth in our lives. And that's what I want to talk to us about today. Uh, and the first lesson is, um, is about the environment in which we, we live our life and we grow. And there's an old adage, uh, rose gardening, is that um, I'd rather plant a $2 bush in a $10 hole than a $10 bush in a $2 hole. And, and some of us go about life in exactly the opposite way. We wanna get the $10 bush and we wanna dig just a tiny little hole and shove it in the ground and expect it to grow. But the truth is, you're far better off taking something much smaller and creating a whole environment, digging a big hole to be able to let it grow and to nurture itself. Um, we, we take too many shortcuts in the garden, and I think we do that in our lives as well. We, we want to get the, the product, and so we, we find the most expensive plant, if we will, in our, our, our spiritual life, and we want to just stick that into, we don't want to do the hard work of digging in the soil and creating an environment for growth. That takes a lot of work. That's what we talk about in the discipline of our faith. Uh, that's like daily prayer. That's like waking up in the morning and taking time to spend in prayer with God. It's what we do when we uh, spend 15, 20, 30 minutes reading scripture each day. That's the kind of toil it is to, to dig the hole, to create an environment in which our spiritual life can grow to make sure that we are in worship on Sunday mornings and that we put ourselves in the context of the community of faith where we can strengthen one another in our own spiritual journey by being in Sunday school with one another and talking about the lesson. Just ask anyone who ever teaches Sunday school, they'll always tell you, I learned far more by being a teacher than I did by being a student. 
And it's because you take the time to learn the lesson so you can convey it yourself. It's digging a big hole that your spiritual life can grow in. And then putting all kinds of good soil and nutrients into it uh, to be able to help nurture one's life. There's a, another phrase that gardeners will use. If you feed the soil, the soil will feed you. And, um, and that's, that's true. You gotta be putting good nutrients into your soil and working it in. I don't like to use a lot of uh, chemical fertilizers. I like to you know, work in good soil and compost and, and other things that can be feeding the garden over a longer period of time and still use uh, some uh, of the chemical fertilizers. It's not like they're terrible. But, but what we wanna do in our life is to create a whole environment that allows our spiritual life to grow and that of our families. And when we dig a deep spiritual hole and nurture it, you ever noticed how close the word soil and soul are? In most of the gardening metaphors, if you take out the word soil and you put the word soul, if you feed the soul, the soul will feed you. Doesn't that work? If we feed our spiritual life, if we feed our soul, our soul will invigorate the rest of our life and give us joy for living. It, so, so many of the gardening metaphors are ones that can teach us about our spiritual life and how we are to grow. We uh, need to be sure that, that we are replenishing the soil and the soul as we go in our lives. Um, and we have to do it with the long view in mind. We have to be looking for the long growth of our, our garden. I, I remember... I was surprised, I think my secretary was even more shocked, but uh, when I was in Prague, the secretary, her mother lived up in Kansas, and I guess she had told her mom that I liked rose gardening, so one, one day, her mom called her up at the church and, and said, I'd like to talk to the preacher, and she said, well, you've never talked to the preacher before, why do you wanna talk to the preacher? And she said, that's really none of your business, I'd like to talk to the preacher, and so, you know, uh, she comes in and says, my mom's on the phone and wants to talk to you. And, and so I answer, and, and, um, and she says, I've got this rose, and you know, and, and so she begins to ask me about it. And she said, every year I've trimmed it back and it never does anything. And um, what should I do with it? I'm just, I'm just about ready to get rid of it. And, and, I, and I, I said to her, one of the things that I think we often do wrong in growing roses is that we're told we're supposed to cut them back in the spring and that too many people cut them back too far every year and then it doesn't do what it's supposed to do. I, I believe there are all kinds of different roses, but I believe roses will grow into the shape that they're supposed to be if you just give them some space and some room. And I said, so don't trim it back this year. Don't do anything with it in that regard. You know, make sure it gets water. Make sure you feed it, tend to it. But just let it grow out and see what it does. And then once you see what it's doing, then you can figure out how to, to live with it because it's got its own personality and its own way that it is supposed to grow. Well, fall came and she called me back up and she said, you were right. That rose had its best year ever whenever I just let it do its thing. And I think in our spiritual lives, sometimes that's a part of what we need to do. We need to allow our spirit to grow, allow our spirit to find its place, and it's different for each one of us. Paul talks about us each having different spiritual gifts, different ways that God has blessed us in our lives, and we need to be able to let that grow. And it's gonna look different for me, and it's gonna look different for you. And it sure looks different for my son than it does for me. God allows our spirit to grow in ways that are different for each of us. And we need to give ourselves space to figure that out and to, to let our spirits grow into what God has designed each of us to be. Because there's something special that God holds for each one of us that we won't be able to do if we're trying to do it like somebody else. But if we allow God to work in us that way, then certainly 
we will be able to shine, we will be able to bloom, we will come in to what God has called us to be in our lives. But one of the first steps is we have to be willing to die. We have to be willing to let go of our expectations. The, that's the part that, that's hard for us. It's the part that's really difficult because we often want to control our lives. We want to decide what it will be and how it will go. Or maybe life is so out of control we don't have any sense of framework on that. And we need to be able to let go of that and invite God into our lives so that God can begin a good work in each of us. God designs that for us. There are parts of our lives that we need to die to, parts of our lives that will cause us to, to, to go in the wrong direction. Uh, one of the ways we talk about that is sin. There are parts of our nature that are sinful and that will lead us astray. And that part of it we have to let die in order for the design that God has at work in our lives to grow. And that we give to him. We die to self so that God can let our true selves come about. And then something far more beautiful will begin to grow. I, whenever roses are designed, a new rose is created, they'll take two parent roses that each have characteristics that they want to pass on, and they'll take the pollen from one and put into the seed of the other, and they'll cross them. And usually, whenever I, I've gotten to know several rose hybridizers, they call themselves, um, they, they will take and they will create maybe 10,000 seeds crossing two different roses. So they'll take the, the pollen from one, cross to the other, the seed grows, they harvest the seeds, and then they plant them. Did you know that every one, just like people, every one of those seeds will grow to be a different rose? None of them will be exactly the same. 10,000 different roses that they will grow up. And then they will watch them. And they'll say, oh, well, those aren't going to be what we want. And so they'll toss some away. And then these will separate over here. And, and these are the ones we really want to watch. And they'll take maybe 100, maybe 50 of them that they'll grow throughout the season. And then... After that next year is over, they'll grow, they'll, they'll maybe get it down to a dozen. And what'll happen is there'll be three or four that they think are truly worthy of introducing to the public. And then they'll try to find someone who will buy them and, and then market them to the, the, the larger. Uh, you just thought you got Mr. Lincoln easily, you know, it didn't happen. It, someone worked hard to make that happen. Uh, all those different roses came out of that hard work. And what it says to me is that God is at work in each of us trying to bring out a new creation and that God's gonna always make each of us distinct and individual, but we have to be willing to let go of our own self so that God can make us into who we need to be. There's a risk in burying because the seed, if you just hold it, the seed has all the potential in the world but then once it becomes actualized, then it changes. And we have to risk letting go in order for something new to happen. A seed that's unplanted is safe and it is always potential. But did you know, sometimes we can hold on to the seed so long, but, but still that potential always is there for new growth. Sometimes seeds will die but amazingly, several years ago, they took from, it was a Chinese tomb, and they found of this Chinese tomb in the stomach of one of the people who was buried there, some seeds. And they took those seeds, 4,000-year-old seeds. This person had eaten whatever it was they had eaten 4,000 years before. And they took the seeds from that person's stomach and they planted them. And do you know what grew up? Watermelon. Beautiful, big watermelons. And um, 
And that's just an amazing thing. A seed 4,000 years old still holds potential. Do you ever feel like maybe sometimes you, your life has grown dry? Your life spiritually is not on track? And maybe it's been off track for a while. But what that says to me is that there's always hope for us if we are willing to risk planting the seed of our life and allowing it to grow. If we're willing to just, uh, it may have been dormant for a long time. Your faith may have not been alive, may have not been growing, but God still is at work and a part of your life. And if you're willing to invest yourself, God is more than willing to bless that and to cause new growth to occur in your life. It's never too late to begin working on your spiritual life. God can always teach and always bring something new to you if you're willing to step in and to make the investment. Then there's the other part we often don't talk about, and that is a pruning. Now, I said sometimes you need to just let it grow so you can figure out what it is. But once you do, then you need to know how to trim back. Because in each of our lives, there are things that would grow, things that we would send out that are in need of being reined in. I suspect in your own life you've experienced that as well, where you've maybe allowed something to take over your life that really was not what your life should be about. It's easy, I notice, uh, with parents. Parents get so invested in their kids, and we need to be invested in our kids, but sometimes our lives as parents become so focused upon our children that we forget to let our own life be growing. It's an important lesson for us to learn. And it's not that we give ourselves over to bad things always, but that sometimes even something good, if it becomes the sole focus of our life, becomes unhealthy in the way that it's lived. I could spend a lot of time playing guitar. I love to play guitar. I have, Bruce was asking me the other day, he's in the office and I had a couple of guitars in there. How many guitars do you really have? And uh, I have four is how many I have. That's, that's probably too many. Um, I, but I just, I love each one of them. I could spend so much time on guitar, I would miss the focus of what my true calling in life is. I know it's not to be a guitarist. It's not as a musician. It's to be something else. But we can give ourselves to even good things in a way that it takes the wrong precedence. And there we have to trim back and to put our life into perspective. We need to be able to offer ourselves to God and to cut off where we need to, to allow for, for new growth to develop. And when we do, then we arrive at the harvest that just as in Jesus' life, he had to let his life go so that life may be shared with others. In Jesus, he understood. And he wasn't just saying this uh, for our own sake. He was telling us about what his life was about. That he had to let go of his life so that he could be buried and raise new life in each of us. That's what he did. He was willing to let go of his life so that we could live, so that we could experience the fullness of, of life that God's intended for us. Jesus could have lived. What if he had lived to a ripe old age, had his little cottage next to the, the carpenter shop and, and lived a long life, a full life, had a family, gone on and and then died at a very old age, none of us would have known about him. None of us would have experienced the gift that he gave to us in giving his life, of showing us that there's something more than clinging to our own lives, that God has a design for us that's far bigger, to set us free from all that would hold us back and to allow us to grow into eternal life. It's not that we become a doormat. It's not that we just give ourselves over so that everyone can just run over the top of us. That's not what 
it's designed for. But when we are able to let our life go so that we can help another person's life grow, that's an amazing thing. It's the most amazing thing I've ever experienced in my life. It's why I love being a pastor, is whenever I'm able to find through the work of Christ in the church, someone whose life has been changed and turned around, and to be a, a part of their growing in that journey, it's, it's amazing. And I know you have been a part of that for other people. Who are the people whose lives you've helped nurture? You've helped give to them in order that they might become more than they have been in their lives. Jesus is the one who models that for us, that kind of self-giving, so that a person can become more, so that we can become more. And Jesus, who is the bread of life, I think I may have skipped over an image, but it really doesn't matter. Oh, well. The, uh, Jesus, who is the grain, who gives himself for us, becomes for us the very bread of life that nurtures us in our life. If you go to Jerusalem, there's a, a Holocaust museum there, and the parking lot is far away from where the museum is, and it's, it's that way for a purpose. The purpose is that you walk through this long corridor of trees, and the trees are there, they call the, it the Avenue of the Righteous. And it is the place where people who helped give of themselves to save Jews during World War II and the Holocaust uh, are honored. It's the only place where a Gentile would be recognized as righteous and described in that way. The story uh, there is that one of the trees is uh, named after uh, Aristod uh, Mendez. And he was uh, an aristocrat from Portuguese, or he's Portuguese from Portugal. And he was uh, an ambassador with the French government. And one of the things that he was noted for was that he, he was not supposed to allow any more Jews to migrate to Portugal. Um, they had already hit the max in number that was supposed to be allowed. But he just couldn't stand it to turn down more and more people who came looking for a way to get out. And he would say yes to all of them. Over 10,000 people who he allowed that were far beyond what was supposed to be allowed. And later when it was realized that 10,000 people were saved by his allowing Jews to cross over from France into Portugal and to enter a whole new life, um, they decided to honor him. And when they did, they asked the question, why did you do it? And he said, I'm a Christian. I could do no other. I could do no other. It was about putting his life putting his work, putting everything about himself at risk so that he could enable the life of another. He could not do otherwise. In our lives, we have the opportunity to help nurture growth in other people. People that sit beside you in the pews today, people who are a part of your life, and maybe you hadn't really thought about it, but they're a gift to you from God to be able to let you help them grow in their own life. Where are you planting the seeds of faith? I hope you're finding lots of good people to invest in, lots of good people to, to share your faith with and to help enable them to grow into who it is God has designed them to be. Because ultimately, the greatest form of gardening we can ever do is when we are gardening in the soul of one another. Amen.